and welcome to On the Menu, Nutrition and Parkinson's. My name is Annie Long and I'm a Community Program Manager for the Parkinson's Foundation. Today's program is being hosted by the following Parkinson's Foundation chapters. We want to thank our sponsors, Acadia Pharmaceuticals, Accorda Therapeutics, Amniel, Adamus, Lundbeck, and Supernus, formerly known as US World Meds, who made today's program possible. We also want to thank our Silver Level sponsor, Kiowa Kieran, for today's support. The Parkinson's Foundation hosts virtual events each Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. To learn more and to register, please visit parkinson.org slash pdhealth. You can also visit this page to view archived PD Health at Home virtual programs. The mission of the Parkinson's Foundation is to make lives better for people living with Parkinson's disease by improving care and advancing research today until there's a tomorrow without the disease. And everything we do, we build on the energy, experience, and passion of the global Parkinson's community. We provide free resources, including our website, parkinson.org, an educational book series, webinars, podcasts, our hospital safety kit called Aware and Care, and our toll-free helpline, 1-800-4PD-INFO, which is staffed by Parkinson specialists. We invest more than $10 million annually to support the most talented minds in research to explore what causes Parkinson's, how to treat it, and ultimately how to cure it. We recently launched a very exciting initiative called PD Generation, which provides free genetic testing and counseling to those with a Parkinson's diagnosis. To learn more, please visit parkinson.org slash PD Generation. We bring local communities together through Moving Day, a walk for Parkinson's, a national grassroots event that's raised nearly $27 million to support Parkinson's Foundation research and local wellness programs across the country. For more information and to register, visit movingdaywalk.org. To learn more about our resources and our upcoming virtual events, visit our website at parkinson.org or call our helpline. Again, that number is 1-800-4PD-INFO. Now I'm very excited to announce today's hosts. Bill Amidon and Marianne Shanahan, who are in their seventh year of their Parkinson's journey. Bill is a person with Parkinson's and Marianne as a care partner. After Bill was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2016, they moved from Maine to Burlington, North Carolina, and are grateful to receive care from Dr. Nina Browner at UNC. They are both actively involved in their local Parkinson's community and founded Talking Parkinson's, a support forum for people with Parkinson's and care partners. They have successfully participated in several Moving Day and Sea Triangle walks with their team, Together is Better, and in 2018 and 2020, Marianne was awarded scholarships to the Parkinson's Foundation Care Partner Summit, and recently was appointed to the Executive Committee of the Carolinas Chapter Advisory Board. Take it away, Bill and Marianne. Thanks so much, Annie. All right. Okay. All right. Um, we are very happy to be here today hosting for the Parkinson's Foundation. Before we start the program, Mary Ann will tell you a bit about the role of nutrition in our lives. Hello everyone. When Bill and I met and married 13 years ago at ages 66 and 63, he was more carnivore than omnivore and loved red meat, bacon and eggs, ice cream and diet soda. I was a pescatarian who ate wild caught fresh fish and farm to table organic fruits and vegetables avoided all processed and canned foods, and rarely used oil or butter. I compromised by adding chicken and turkey to the menu. Bill dropped diet soda and only ate red meat and bacon when eating out. In 2018, at the Parkinson's Foundation Care Partners Summit, a Care Partners presentation outlined the positive impact of a whole food plant-based lifestyle on his wife, who has PD, and on him. Back home, I researched articles and was impressed by the documented impact of the lifestyle on health, as well as the purported impact of the elimination of sugar 
on persons with PD who have mild cognitive impairment, as does Bill. Bill is game to change our lifestyle. Within the first several months, he lost 46 pounds. He now is no longer on Lipitor or an antihypertensive or the mild antidepressant that was prescribed when he was diagnosed with PD. He sleeps better and rarely uses his CPAP machine. His mood, energy, focus, enthusiasm, and productivity have increased almost exponentially. And the dreaded PD constipation is essentially eradicated when exercise and good water hydration are also maintained. I too have lost weight and we both have benefited in many ways to the point we're a bit more flexible and now have occasional wild caught fish and eggs. But we are adamant about no meat, no sugar, oil, or added salt. We are grateful to be here and to share this story with you and this time, all of you who are also on this Parkinson's journey. Bill? As a reminder, uh, you can submit your questions by clicking on the Q&A icon in the black banner on the bottom of your viewing page at any time during the program. We will do our best to respond to as many questions as we can during the Q&A segment. We have a lot to cover today, so without further ado, I am very thrilled to introduce our featured speaker, Dr. Laurie Mishley. Dr. Mishley studied uh, naturopathic medicine at Bastyr University and epidemiology and nutritional sciences at the University of Washington. Her work is focused on identifying the nutritional requirements unique to individuals with neurodegenerative diseases. She has published on coenzyme Q10, lithium, and glutathione deficiency in Parkinson's disease. Dr. Mishley maintains a clinical practice at Seattle Integrative Medicine focused on nutrition and neurological health. Welcome, Dr. Mishley, and thank you. Hello and thank you. Um, let me just get my screen up. Okay, so thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm thrilled to have this conversation. I could probably continue this conversation for the next 10 years and not get bored with it. Um, so what I wanna do today is, is thank you for this introduction. I'm not gonna spend any more time talking about how I got here. Um, but I'm going to start on a little bit more of a depressing tone, and I assure you this, this lecture will become more and more empowering as it goes on, and we'll leave on a very positive note. Um, the story you just described is what I get to hear in practice over and over. I mean, every single day in practice, I hear exactly what you're describing. And so we have this, this issue where people are experiencing benefits or not experiencing benefits, but we haven't done the research yet to know if you change your diet, is it going to make a huge difference? But anecdotally, the stories are adding up. So what I wanna to do today, tomorrow you're gonna to talk to a dietitian who will give you some details about actual implementation. What I wanna to do today is talk about the science. Um, what do we know about the role of nutrition in, in Parkinson's disease being diagnosed and progression? Um, there are a bunch of reasons people with Parkinson's are at increased risk of malnutrition. Um, it is not just, um, you know, as we age, everyone's stomach acid starts to be reduced and meals become smaller and smaller. As your sense of smell decreases, food becomes less appealing. Smell contributes to the taste of food. Between the loss of smell and apathy and fatigue, it is harder to stand at the counter chopping vegetables if you're tired. Um, when you're depressed, you're just not motivated to go to the farmer's market and try new meals. Um, having a movement disorder itself can interfere. It is hard to eat soup. It is hard to you know, use chopsticks. And so there are some actual physical reasons it is difficult to um, to, to try new foods and expand one's diet. Anybody who's ever been constipated knows that constipation is absolutely a deterrent for food. Um, and stress. I mean, everyone has heard the term fight or flight, and th it, that's in reference to the sympathetic nervous system, and that's really overactive in Parkinson's disease. And so the nervous system, sympathetic the autonomic nervous system is like a teeter-totter where you're either in fight or flight or rest and digest. They don't both go up and down. It's one or the other. So the more stress you feel, um, blood flow goes to your arms, your legs. They make it so you can think and run. Um, 
that's not a good time when you're under stress and running from danger to worry about digesting and absorbing the nutrients from your food. So all of these things combine to make uh, malnutrition a huge risk factor in Parkinson's disease. It is so hard to study nutrition. The best assessment tools we have are about 30% wrong. And so imagine if you went in to go get your cholesterol levels checked and your true total cholesterol was 100, but the tool that we're using to measure it is somewhere between a 70 and a 130. That's what we're dealing with when we try and measure how much butter you eat, how much olive oil you eat. Unless you are the cook and unless you are measuring every single bite and dividing that lasagna into 12 pieces and dividing your you know, one cup of cheese you put on the lasagna divided by 12, people get it wrong. There's bias in our assessment tools um, and it's not intentional bias. A huge percentage of the calories that people eat over the course of the day, they don't even remember eating. You know, samples at the grocery store, um, as you're cleaning up the dishes at the end of a meal, you steal a couple bites. As you're cooking, you taste the food. And so um, assessing nutrition is really, really difficult. Even when we get into biomarkers, um, measures of vitamin D in blood or magnesium, we don't know if, if uh, plasma magnesium, red blood cell magnesium, or hair magnesium correlates better with the muscle cramps of Parkinson's, if at all. And so even though we do have biomarkers for some of these nutrients, we haven't done the studies that, tells us to, that tell us which biomarker is better in which circumstance. Um, your clinician should be looking for clinical symptoms of malnutrition. Turger res responds to, you know, how, how quickly your skin pops back, you know, if you're dehydrated and you pinch your hand, the skin will stay up a little bit longer and be slower to, to go back to its original shape. Glossitis is a swelling in your tongue. Um, muscle Sarcopenia is when you start to lose muscle mass, very, very common in Parkinson's disease. And so these are all things that should clue your physician in to the idea that malnourishment may be an issue for you. Um, so, According to the most common assessment tool that we use for nutrition, just kind of a cheap, quick, are they malnourished or not? Um, that is called the MNA, the Mini Nutritional Assessment. And according to that tool, about 15 to 22% of people with Parkinson's meet the criteria for overt malnutrition. We know that it's not just, we, we know that Parkinson's increases your risk of being malnourished. That's been established. But separate from Parkinson's disease, independent from Parkinson's, even among people who don't have Parkinson's disease, being elderly, being constipated, being depressed, having difficulty swallowing, having apathy, cognitive decline, or weight loss are all independently red flags for this person is either malnourished or at risk of becoming malnourished. And so when you take the Parkinson's disease that most of you have, uh, most of you can probably check a couple other independent risk factors on this list that, you know, it make the problem only more um, real. So the symptoms associated with Parkinson's disease malnutrition, how would you know if you were malnourished? Um, constipation is certainly the first one. The human body needs water. A lot of us don't get enough water. There's actually a study that goes, that says the earliest symptom we have ever been able to find in people with Parkinson's, 18.8 um, years prior to diagnosis, there was a cohort of people who went on to develop Parkinson's, who 18 years before they were diagnosed were already re less thirsty, drinking less water, and more likely to be constipated. And so I, I really stress that part about they weren't thirsty. And so we don't know, it's easy to say, um, we don't know chicken or the egg, why that is. But I, my point here is that people with Parkinson's need to train themselves to drink water. They need to have some sort of reminder tool or a goal to try and get through these four glasses per day or something. Because I don't think that a person with Parkinson's can necessarily trust their, their brain and body to say, hey, I'm thirsty, go get some water. So it's something that you have to teach yourself to do consciously. Um, Fiber insufficiency um, certainly can be a problem. It is really hard. People think because they ate some a salad yesterday or some broccoli that they got their fiber in. If you actually spend, I, and I encourage all of you to do this, spend about three days just 
paying attention to how much fiber you're eating. Everything that you eat, look it up and find out how much fiber does it have. You actually want to get 25 to 30 grams per day. Most Americans get less than 12. And so it is actually really quite difficult to get as much fiber as you need. And I'll teach you the trick is bean. beans are kind of the, the best bang for your buck. A half cup of beans will probably get you pretty close to your daily requirement. Um, prunes, this is not a nutritional deficiency, obviously, but these are some ideas for things that can help because again, there's a Constipation increases your risk of malnutrition. People who are malnourished are more likely to be constipated. And what we see is that quality of life certainly improves when you're no longer constipated, but so does your ability to absorb nutrients. So this is both kind of cause and solution. Prunes, fruits and vegetables, um, really try and target five to six cups per day. I'll get to this in a minute, but we can actually measure in our data that more fresh fruits and more, we can measure people who are eating six to 12 servings of fresh fruits and vegetables a day, we can measure them progressing slower than people who are eating four to six cups per day. So dose matters. Um, when you're, for people who have difficulty with digestion, really focusing on easy to digest foods, things like smoothies, soups, stews, are a lot easier to digest than Thanksgiving dinner. And then medically speaking, your physician should be able to work with you to rule out a whole bunch of things that we deal with daily in a Parkinson's practice related to, Parkin to constipation, which is um, low stomach acid. I believe 50 to 60% of people with Parkinson's have low stomach acid. As many as 50% of people have an infection called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. A very much smaller percentage have an infection called H. pylori. Many people have lactose intolerance. Constipation is a symptom of lactose intolerance. So you and your physicians can kind of work through that last line together, but these are some ideas for people who find themselves back battling constipation. Constipation is the number one risk factor for malnourishment. If we're trying to find people who are malnourished, first, you know, the, the constipation is going to be the first biggest risk factor. Depression is the second. Um, again, so, so certainly, um, there was a study with fish oil capsules. We'll get to the fish oil capsules in a minute, and I didn't want to get into supplements here, but I will say that there have been studies of people with Parkinson's disease and depression. And when they supplemented for three months with omega-3 fish oil capsules, uh, the researchers actually saw a statistically significant decrease in symptoms of depression. So my advice to you right now is at the very least start getting more fish, oily fish, small healthy oily fish um, in your diet. The Environmental Working Group has an awesome list of foods that are low in mercury, oily, have a lot of omega-3 fatty acids. They come from areas that are not already overfished. And so I use that as my guide for which fish to encourage in my diet. And in terms of whether or not you should take an omega-3 fatty acid supplement, I think you should talk to your physicians about that. Uh, cognitive impairment, dementia, is a huge problem in Parkinson's disease. Um, and globally, uh, outside of Parkinson's disease, there was a really well done study by the US government uh, a couple years back. And what they did was they looked at the fish and omega-3 fatty acid status of the US population and they broke people into quadrants. And what they calculated was if everybody in the lower three quarters ate as much fish, had as high omega-3 fatty acid levels as the top quadrant, that we could reduce the number of people with Alzheimer's by 50%. That is a huge number. I mean, really, if there's one thing I wanna communicate here today is that there is more research than I think we're acknowledging and we're not using a lot of the research that we have. Um, so for, a, a huge analysis, again, this was not in Parkinson's disease, this was just 21 individual studies done around the world looking at dietary fish intake and risk of cognitive impairment and going on to develop dementia. Across the board showed that the more fish a, a, a population eats, the lower the rates of dementia and cognitive impairment. 
And then the other thing I want everyone to be aware of that is a little nutritional is that most of you are on levodopa. Levodopa does, it, it fa is a fabulous, fabulous drug and anyone who knows me know that I encourage my patients to use it. Um, but one of the downsides of levodopa is it interferes with the body's ability to absorb and utilize folate and B12. And so what will happen is as you're on levodopa, um, you really have to work hard to make sure you don't develop a B12 or folate deficiency. And so the way we do that is we measure a homocysteine level once a year to just make sure that you are not developing that deficiency. There have been several studies, um, both in Parkinson's disease and in healthy aged populations that show the higher your homocysteine, the increase, higher your risk of dementia. So in our clinical practice, what we do is anybody who is on levodopa once a year, we peak at their homocysteine level. I think it's about a $15 test. We make sure that it's below 10. If it's below 10, there's nothing they need to do. If it goes up above 10, then we ask them to start supplementing with a B12 and folate supplement to, with the goal of get, keeping their homocysteine levels down. Homocysteine itself can be neurotoxic. And so it's just one of the downsides of levodopa, but it's an easily, easily um, workable problem. So food is so much more than calories. Um, we don't only eat because we're hungry. We eat because we're bored. We eat because we're lonely. We eat because we're nervous or sad or angry. Um, there are a lot of reasons we eat, and I think anybody who's embarking in the idea of dietary modification is going to have to confront way more than um, ingredients. Um, there are going to be habits to break, and when you share meals with your family and you've got some teenage kids who want nothing to do with your health food, but you feel the sense of loyalty to yourself to try to get healthier via food, you know, there's this conflict now and this new stress that you're going to have to navigate. And so, um, you know, I don't have easy answers for that, but I will say that it's really important. The, the, rec the food recommendations that I'm recommending for um, healthy living with Parkinson's disease also happen to be the food recommendations that have been shown to decrease your risk of Alzheimer's disease, obesity, cardiovascular disease, cancer. Um, so it really is in your entire family's best interest to dive into this. Um, but we can't make people do other things. And so I guess just open, honest conversations with your loved ones about your goals, your commitment, what you're trying to do, and um, asking for their support. Maybe they can get their cheeseburgers when they go out, but at the home you eat a certain way. Um, but that's really, it's a, it's a stressor and it's not all roses to switch your diet. So um, in my research, what, where, where I found myself as a physician with a PhD in nutritional sciences, trying to help people with Parkinson's, I found myself trying to choose between different, different opinions of different providers. You know, um, there are four to six really well-informed academic teachers in the field who say, you know, eat grass-fed beef. No, don't, you know, don't eat grains. Whatever you do, don't eat legumes. No, you really need tons of legumes. And what I did was I found myself frustrated that I didn't know who to trust. Uh, it, it really became kind of a who's the best salesperson um, in terms of who I was going to listen to, you know, can't person Dr. A or Camp Dr. B. And, and I was, felt like I was choosing sides because sometimes their, their recommendations conflicted. And so what I wanted to do was not be another academic with another opinion. I wanted to kind of approach the whole thing a little bit differently. And so what I did was I designed a study that completely left me out of it. Um, what I did was I set out to see if I could find the people who were doing unusually well progressing unusually slowly, 10, 15, 20 years after diagnosis, they were hardly had any symptoms and their quality of life was high, and compare what they were eating to the diets of the people who were progressing unusually quickly. What are they eating that the slow progressors aren't? So this is the, we, we are now seven years into this study. We are following over two. 2,200 people I think we have at this point in the study. We are still recruiting. The more of you that join the study, the better our, the quality of our data. So I would love for people who are on this call to join the study. There's a link at the end of this. But I wanted to explain to you where the data is coming from that I'm about to present to you. So to be clear, we do not have data that says 
if you change your diet, your symptoms will get better. We don't, we don't, it, there isn't a study that says it won't. We just haven't done that study yet. We have not yet looked, and there are not enough people in the natural history study to be able to say, if you change your diet, will you change the course of the disease? What I'm about to show you today is data that simply says, the people who are, are progressing very, very slowly or not at all are eating very differently than the people who are progressing quickly. I don't know what is cause, I don't know what is effect, um, it might be that all the people who eat broccoli are also exercising and it really has very little to do with the broccoli. It's, a, it's the exercise. We don't know. All it, it, in my very, very simplified approach to this, my, if, if I had Parkinson's and my approach that I take for my patients is just find the people who are doing really well and do what they're doing. Find the people who are doing poorly. Don't do what they're doing. Um, I'm not going to try and, and I don't have answers. I don't know why all these foods made the list. It it's, happens to be convenient that most of them make quite a bit of sense. But I do want to just stress that there are, if we're going to, I'm not going to wait and I'm not going to recommend that my patients wait until we understand nutritional biochemistry and the human brain before they start eating more broccoli. Um, sometimes you don't need to understand the mechanism of action to take action. So, so as simple as it is, I just broke this into good and bad, and my advice is do all the stuff in green as much as you can, avoid the stuff in red. So for all of these data, we compared people in the same age, who are the same age and the same income bracket of the same gender diagnosed at the same time. And what we saw, um, I'll get to all these good things in a minute, but I really want to draw attention to food scarcity. Um, this, this entire chart is available on the website Living Healthy with Parkinson's. That website is kind of the cheat sheet summary of what we've done so far. But I want to talk about food scarcity because it affects so many people dealing with, with the financial crisis in, that we're in right now. I believe food scarcity is only going to become a greater issue in the next year. But nothing, the single biggest predictor of related to diet of faster Parkinson's progression were people who said true to the statement, it is difficult to afford groceries and I find it difficult to afford healthy food. So to put that in perspective, um, 360 points more severe. When you look at what does that mean? Okay, so those people on average were 360 points more severe. The average person gets worse at 38 points per year. So that means that a person who, two people who are 10 years out, one person says, I have no problem affording groceries and healthy food. That's, they are typical 10 year out Parkinson's disease severity score. Compare them to another person diagnosed 10 years ago who finds it difficult to avoid healthy, afford healthy food. That other person is about 19, as their symptoms are as severe as a person who is 19 years into their disease. That is a tremendous difference. And so when we think about helping people with Parkinson's disease, we think about the next pharmaceutical, we think about brain surgery. I, I really think that um, financial insecurity has to start to enter the conversation because our data crystal clear says food scarcity and financial insecurity makes everything worse and is associated with worse Parkinson's symptoms across the board. It's, Healthy food is perishable. It's not, not as easy to keep it around. It requires more trips to the grocery store and not everybody can afford um, organic food. And so what I recommend is the Environmental Working Group has a list of the dirty dozen and the clean 15. They update it every year. And what they do is they say, hey, given, given what pesticides were used on crops this year, these are the 12 foods that are so heavily sprayed that we recommend if you can't get them organic, just don't eat them. As opposed to the Clean 15, um, the way they were grown in farming practices this year, whether even the conventional ones barely have any pesticides. So don't worry about it. You don't have to spend the extra money because an organic pineapple isn't actually that much cleaner than a conventionally grown pineapple. And so that list can be very helpful to save a little money and help you pick and choose your battles. So these are the good, these were the um, people who said true to each of these were, had a statistically slower rate 
rate of Parkinson's progression. So I'm going to take a minute, I'm going to read through them, but as I read through them, what I would like you to do is kind of collect your points. There, there are 10 statements here, and I just want each of you to get a sense of how many points do you get. Um, I cook most of my own meals. I routinely prepare mood, meals for others. I avoid artificial sweeteners. I avoid artificial colors and flavors. I avoid soda. I avoid dairy. I avoid pork. I avoid beef. I buy from local farmers and I try to eat organically grown foods when possible. So I guess my ask of you, um, I don't know that everyone needs to do all 10 of those things. We don't know. I don't know. Um, but my ask is that every one of you, whatever your number was, can you add one more to the list moving forward? Can you pick one thing on this list that you can start doing that you were not previously doing? Um, in terms of the organically grown foods, I'll just say yes, people who said true to the statement, I try to eat organically grown foods when possible, had fewer symptoms over time. That kind of makes sense. We've known for many years that um, pesticides increase your risk of developing Parkinson's disease. Um, here, there's, you know, people who avoid them seem to be doing better. Again, we don't know that pesticides make your disease progress faster. It might be that well-informed, motivated people who are actually looking at their ingredients are also more conscious in other ways and they're doing other things that are helpful. So again, this is association, not causation, but my goal here was just to describe the people who are doing really well and let you know what they're doing. The other thing I'll point out here is it doesn't say, I always eat organic food. Nobody can always eat organic food. I wouldn't expect that. I don't think that's realistic, but I would say that um, I, I think the emphasis here is on I try when possible. Um, diet is not just a source of nutrients, it's also a source of toxicants. I don't want to get into all of these, but I will just say um, our food is filled with things that have been shown to kill dopamine neurons. Um, and some of these have even been shown to, at least in rats and some in humans, um, cause symptoms of Parkinsonism. So these are studies we have not done as well as we should have, um, but there is reason everything on this slide has been linked to a potential contributor to Parkinsonism. So food choices and Parkinson's progression. I think this is what most of you really want to know. This is the cheat sheet. This is the summary of what we know. I'm the messenger. I, this is not my idea. This is not, um, I'm not the one telling you to eat these things, avoid these things. I am just telling you that we can say with greater than 95% confidence, the people who are doing the best over time, and it's dose dependent, more is better, the more fresh vegetables, fresh fruit, nuts and seeds, non-fried fish, wine, olive oil, coconut oil, and fresh herbs a person eats, the slower we can measure them progressing. The people who are progressing the fastest are eating statistically more canned fruit, canned vegetables, fried foods, pasta, diet soda, soda, ice cream, cheese, and yogurt, beef, chicken, pork, and frozen vegetables. So we could talk for a very long time about why I think these things are on the list or not on the list, um, but I will point out that the foods in green are very similar to what we see in the Mediterranean diet, in the MIND diet that is used for Alzheimer's disease. Nobody looks at that green list and says, wow, that's really mind-blowing. I can't believe those are the foods that are associated with better outcomes over time. Um, I have no problem selling people on the idea that the foods in green are good for your brain. I meet all kinds of resistance when we start talking about um, the foods in red somehow contributing to the disease. So um, we'll come back to that in a minute. I'll take some questions about that. Um, but I just want to point out a couple things that really could be game changers in terms of uh, malnutrition and your overall quality of life. Many people with Parkinson's are told, um, they should be told at diagnosis when they start levodopa, that um, any dietary protein in, in your stomach can interfere with levodopa from working. And so kind of Parkinson's 101, we tell people, hey, make sure to take your levodopa 30 minutes before or one hour after a meal. That is a good starting place, and I think that's a reasonable rule of thumb. But truth be told, that is not enough time for most people. Um, 
I, I've had a lot of people kind of over the years tell me, you know, I hadn't really realized if I have an egg or two for breakfast in the morning, my meds don't work well all day. If I have red meat at dinner, my meds don't work the next morning. Um, it really depends on not just the grams of protein that you're eating or the type of protein that you're eating, but also how digestible is that protein. You're going to be able to digest and move hummus through your stomach way faster than you are a steak. And so the digestibility, the composition of the protein will all weigh into how long do you have to wait before your meds are working well again. Um, one of the things that I'll do with my patients in clinic is I put them on a four day, very low protein diet. It's not sustainable, but it's a nice thing to do for a couple days just to give people a taste of success. Um, they'll, I'll have them really as much as they can avoid all protein for four days. And by day three or four, you know, most people will say, I, I can't get over how much better my meds were working. I had no idea that um, the little bit of peanut butter I was putting in my morning smoothie was interfering with my meds working for the next four to six hours. So just be aware of that. Um, the answer, I mean, most people, I'd say the easiest thing to do is learn to eat lower protein breakfasts and lunches and then save your dietary protein for the evening meal. Um, and you know, certainly I don't want anyone becoming protein malnourished, but I would say unquestionably, there are way more people in America getting twice as much protein as they need as there are people who have to worry about protein malnutrition. Um, in, in general, people with Parkinson's have to worry about malnutrition, um, but it, protein malnutrition is not something we see a whole bunch of at all. So I do want you to get adequate protein, but my advice is to the degree that you can kind of save it towards the end of the day, that allows your meds to function a little bit better throughout the day. Um, the, the way, the clue that I have that somebody needs to tackle this protein levodopa link is when they say that they're, they have an erratic response to meds. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Or people will say, my first morning dose works better than all my other doses. You know, when their stomach is empty. Um, and so those are some of the clues I look for to decide if I, if I want to kind of dive into this with somebody. Um, the human, just in terms of making sure you don't get uh, protein malnourished. The daily requirement for protein adequacy is 0.8 milligrams per kilogram body weight. So you can do the math. Um, there are, I, I put the calculation out here, but for 155, for an 150 pound person, that translates to about 55 grams of protein per day to um, maintain adequate levels. And so um, this chunk of salmon here that I put on the picture is about 40 grams right there. So um, I mentioned this earlier in the talk, but um, with age, we all kind of lose our digestive fire and our stomach acid levels start to reduce. Um, this is especially true in Parkinson's disease where um, the stomach cells, the cells of the stomach do have three jobs. They make stomach acid, hydrochloric acid. They, uh, they secrete um, something called intrinsic factor that allows us to absorb B12. And they make about 50% of the body's dopamine. So I think a lot of people don't realize how much dopamine is coming from their stomach and how important it is to keep the stomach healthy. Um, it's not supposed to say 505. It's approximately 50%, 50 to 60% of people with Parkinson's disease have insufficient levels of stomach acid. Um, they've done two studies. Researchers know this, scientists know this. And so um, you need stomach acid to digest your levodopa. And um, we've done two studies now that show that if you take your levodopa with 30 mils of lemon juice or one of those packs of emergency, some powdered ascorbic acid, that you can get an extra 25, 30% more out of each levodopa pill. It works, it's absorbed faster, it works better. Um, and so that's just an, it, it, and all you're doing is supplementing the stomach acid that you're supposed to have, you don't have, you're just giving your stomach acid a little bit of a boost and it not only allows you to digest your food better, but your, your medications better as well too. Um, we already talked about homocysteine levels going up for people who are on levodopa. And so um, kind of in summary, my advice is um, meal plans are really important. They save money. I think when people's blood sugar gets low, they get frustrated. Healthy foods are not as prepared and ready to eat as, as prepackaged foods. So a little bit more thoughtfulness needs to go into it. I find that meal plans can actually make it really exciting and fun. Um, in our family, every Sunday, we go through cookbooks and 
the rule is everyone in the house has to come up with a meal, cook a meal, and we try and make it something we've never had before. And it's just a fun way to increase diversity. And then we shop for those foods and try to use leftovers. Um, some of these delivery systems um, around, I'm in Seattle, and I think we have 15 different, you know, organic delivery groups that, you know, every Thursday you can have a $50 bottle of organic, box of organic fruits and vegetables delivered to your for doorstep. It's a cheaper way to, to get your produce, and it forces you to use fruits and vegetables and things that you maybe wouldn't otherwise have used. Um, I really think it's important to make your changes enjoyable and sustainable. I see people all the time who go overboard, they, they get really extreme, and then three or four or five days in, they get frustrated and just go back to where they were. I would much, much, much rather you not make any changes this week. You just think about it. You just talk about it. You talk to your family members about it and just start playing a game like, okay, if I were to make these shifts, what would I have for breakfast instead? Okay, if I were to kind of cross off a couple of the foods on the red list and incorporate more of the foods on the green list. Um, you know, how, what, what would dinners look like? And just kind of really plan and think ahead. I would rather a slow, sustainable change than back and forth, in and out, yo-yo dieting type of thing. Weight loss is a huge problem with, for Parkinson's disease. Um, I'll tell you, oils are the way to go. Um, Fat has more than twice as many calories in it than proteins and carbs. So if you really want to pack on extra weight, um, the easiest thing to do is, is focus on extra fats, um, easily to di easy to digest meals, but I'll also say it is so much more complicated than that. Um, we really need good stomach acid. We need a healthy intestinal tract. We need caloric adequacy. There are so many reasons for weight loss. Um, it is not fair to, for the patient to feel like you're doing something wrong. If only you were eating more fat or more of this or that, that you wouldn't be losing weight at the same way. It's just not like that. Um, I think we as a research community are doing a really, uh, doing you a disservice, disservice by not putting more energy into um, this, this issue of weight loss and malnutrition. So here's that list again of the 10 things um, that if people answer true to these things, they had a statistically slower rate of Parkinson's progression. And again, my ask of you is whatever number of trues you have today, um, can you make it so you have plus one next week? And then here's the summary page again. Um, so let me just say, I'll say probably two of the biggest surprises on here were the canned fruits and canned vegetables. Um, I expected fresh green beans to be better than frozen green beans and frozen green beans to be better than canned green beans. But my expectation was that none of them would be bad for you. I thought they might be neutral, but I didn't think that canned or frozen vegetables would be bad. Um, at first, I thought that might be income. Um, canned vegetables, frozen vegetables are certainly cheaper than fresh, but even after we compared people in the same income bracket, the more frozen vegetables and canned fruits and canned vegetables that people ate, the faster their disease progressed. Um, I've had toxicologists suggest to me that the foods that wind up in, in cans and frozen are, are um, more heavily sprayed with pesticides. I've had other people suggest it's the metal in the can or the bisphenol A in the lining. Fried foods make sense. Um, we've actually done studies showing that if the, the, more, the more you cook your chicken and beef, the more we can measure the alpha-synuclein aggregating in your intestinal tract. Pasta, I don't know. Um, it's interesting that pasta is on the bad list, but bread isn't. A couple of my colleagues have suggested to me that it's not pasta that it's the problem, but pasta is a delivery system for the canned tomatoes or the cheese. So that could be true. Um, soda is not a surprise to anybody. Um, I'll say about dairy. There have now been five studies, huge, with tens of thousands of people in five or six different countries that show over the course of a lifetime, the more dairy anybody eats in their midlife, the more likely they are to get, get a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Um, in fact, a really nice review article recently came out on the, on the epidemiology of Parkinson's disease and the biggest risk factors for developing Parkinson's disease were traumatic brain injury, exposure to pesticides, melanoma, or dairy consumption. So we have known for it, at least 20 years that dairy is a, intake in midlife is associated with increased risk of developing Parkinson's disease. This is the first data that suggests that once diagnosed, the more dairy you eat, the faster the disease progresses. 
I don't know why, but it's not a surprise. Um, beef, chicken, and pork, you know, it could be that there's something dangerous in there. It could be the what we're feeding those animals. It could be that those foods stick around in our stomachs so long that they block the medicines from working. And so it's not that they really make the disease progress faster, but that they're interfering with our meds so we feel worse. So we could spend a really, really, really long time kind of theorizing about why these things made the list. But as I said, I'm the messenger. I'm just here to kind of sample the population and tell you who the success stories are and what they're doing. Um, for people who want a little more information on this, as I said, this livinghealthywithparkinsons.com is the summary website of all of the research that we're doing on CAM care and the study. Um, here's the link to the CAM care study for the people who are interested in participating. It takes about an hour and a half, twice a year. Um, we'll send you an email and just say, hey, it's time to do that survey again. And the more people who join, the stronger the data becomes. Um, this is a place to contact me if you have any questions. And because I know that a lot of you are going to have want a little more detail about some of this stuff, um, I'm teaching an online class. And I have these two classes, how to eat, what to eat. They're each about an hour long. And what I've done is for anybody who's watching this program right now, um, I, I made some coupons so that you can get access to both these classes for free. So for those of you who want to, um, to kind of hear, take a deeper dive into some of this material, um, I've made the, both of those courses available to you. That's it. Thank you so much, Dr. Mishley. Thank you. Before we get to our question and answer portion of today's program, however, we're going to take a short uh, stretch break, which will be led by Taylor Drake. He's a board certified neurologic clinical specialist and a Parkinson wellness recovery, PRW power certified therapist and a certified stroke rehabilitation specialist at Rochester Regional Health. Taylor, you're on. Hey everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today for that wonderful presentation on nutrition. And there's no better compliment to talking about nutrition than talking about exercise. And we're not gonna be doing less talking and more doing today. So actually, let me kind of get into my spot. All right, so as I kind of just prep you for what we're going to be doing today, I just want everyone to start with some very basic marches in a sitting position. So all of our exercises today, we're going to be doing from a chair. If it has armrests, if it doesn't have armrests, either one is perfectly fine. I'll kind of show you some options for both. But right now, just trying to kind of get your knees up towards the ceiling. If you need to slow it down a little bit, that's fine. And to kind of just give you an overview of what we are going to be doing over these next 10 minutes, we're going to go through some very basic stretches to start, and then we will be going over four specific exercises for people with Parkinson's. You may have heard in my bio, I am certified in Parkinson Wellness Recovery, or PWR, or POWER, as we like to call it, and they are a phenomenal organization that created these exercises for people with Parkinson's, four moves target four specific Parkinson's symptoms. You can do them in any position, but we're gonna do it right from seated today. And then we'll do one more exercise after that at the end to kind of wrap things up. All right, so I want everybody to kind of sit up nice and tall, get towards the edge of their chair, and I want you to put your arms straight out like you're saying to stop to somebody. And then I, with your other hand, I want you to pull your fingers towards your face. And you should feel a nice stretch down in your wrist here. So while we hold this, I'm just gonna talk a little bit. So we know through the research that exercise is the only thing proven to slow the progression of Parkinson's. All right, now switch hands. We know that medication can help with the symptoms, but we know that exercise can really help slow the progression it can help you use the dopamine that you do have more efficiently, more effectively. And we know through other various studies, switch arms one more time, that exercise can really help kind of improve your quality of life and slow your overall decline, as well as have help improve your motor symptoms like your walking and your balance. 
One more time, other hand. One study in particular showed that if you exercise for two and a half hours a week in total, that you'll see significant improvements in your kind of quality of life and just overall decline in mobility. So that's, that's great news. We know that exercise can help. And we know that nutrition can help as well. All right, now I want you to reach over top, kind of get a, a good curve in your arm here. Nice, you should feel a nice stretch right in here. And then go to the other side, kind of curve that arm, you should feel a stretch right in your side here. Very good, one more time on each side, then we're gonna go into those four power moves. Feel the stretch right in here. Final time. Very good. Okay, so our first exercise called the power up move. Again, we're seated towards the edge of our chair. We're standing up or sitting up nice and tall because we know that we want to try to counteract that stooped posture. You want to come up nice and tall. I want you to put your hands on your thighs and I want you to bend forward, almost like you're trying to look towards the floor. And then when you sit up, kind of putting your arms back like this, try to squeeze your shoulder blades together and then repeat. So I want you to come down like you're looking at the floor, come back up, squeeze your arms back, really, really pretend there's a pencil between your shoulder blades you need to squeeze. One more time here, just to get you the, the hang of this. Nice and tall, kind of stick your chest out. Very good. What we're looking at there is we wanna to try to really stretch out the muscles in the front of your trunk so that you can get that good posture back while we strengthen the muscles in your back. All right, we're gonna come back to that, but our next one called our power rock. So it's gonna work on our ability to kind of shift our weight, which is gonna help with walking and balance. So again, we're at the edge of our chair. I want you to bring your elbow down towards your, your knee. I want you to put your other foot kind of out the other way. And I want you to put your hand up towards the ceiling. And I, you can see my, my fingers are really extended. I want you to really, really get really straight fingers and really turn your head and look at where your fingers are. You should feel a nice stretch in here. And then return to the middle. And then we're gonna switch sides. So bring your elbow down towards your knee. Leg goes out that way, arm goes up. Really extend your fingers and look up at your fingers. Just feel a stretch right in here. Right? One more time, each side. Up tall, looking at your fingers. Nice, good stretch. And then last time for now on this side. Nice and tall, stretching the fingers, very good. All right, so that was number two of four. Number three is our power twist. So it's gonna work on the flexibility of our trunk. So same thing, sitting at the edge of your chair, nice good posture, kind of spread your feet out a little bit. Arms out, similar to that power up position. I want you to twist and clap your hands. And you can see my hips rotate during this as well. And then reset, stretch back, squeeze your shoulder blades. Other side, twist and clap. You can see your hips should be rotating as well. Open wide. One more time, each side, twist and clap. Open wide. And last time. Very good. So that was number three. Number four, our final one, is called the power step. So it's going to work on your ability, your kind of stepping abilities and your your uh, ability to do some transitions, transitional movements, such as getting up from a chair and going to walk or something like that. This one is a little bit tougher if you have arms on your chairs, but just do whatever is comfortable to you. What I want you to do is pretend that there's a shoebox on the floor down here. I want you to take a nice big step up and over that shoebox with one leg, and then your other leg is gonna come with it. And you can see how now I'm facing this way. If you have arms on your chairs, you can't do that. That's okay, just do what you can. And then we're gonna come back to the middle. Big steps up, big steps up. It's harder if you're not holding on. If you need to hold on to the chair, that's fine. Big step up and over, big step up and over. Nice, good posture. Back to the starting position. 
very good. So like I said, it's, it's a little bit easier if you really imagine that there's a box on the floor and you need to get your foot up and over it. Because sometimes what we like to do is just kind of move, your, move our feet very slow and small. We want to get it nice and big and high. So that when we're walking, we can take those big kind of higher steps so that we're not catching our foot and tripping. All right, so that was all four. Now I want to run through each one just a few times, kind of a little bit quicker. We can get kind of a, a flow going here. So number one, power up move, sitting at the edge of our chair, good posture, arms on our thighs, kind of come down and squeeze your shoulder blades, power up, down, we're gonna do five of them, power up. There's number two, down, power up. There's three, two more, down, up, Final one, power down and up. All right, next one. Arm on your, your knee here, leg goes out. I'm looking up towards the ceiling, really extending my fingers. Go to the other side. Make sure you turn your head and your eyes towards your hand. That'll get some good kind of cervical rotation stretching in. Really go until you feel that stretch. Looking up at the fingers. One more time on each side. Good. Last time. Very good. Now we're back to our edge of our chairs. Arms out. Twisting and clapping. Open wide. Twist and clap. Rotate through the hips as well. Kind of think about it like you're driving a golf ball or hitting a, a baseball. Open wide. One more time, each side. And back to the start position. Our final one is our power step. So remember, imagine that little box on the floor. You've got a big step up, big step up, big step back in, big step back in. Over to the other side, up, back to the start. Good, one more time, each side, up and over, really high, higher than you think you need to. Back to the start, and finally, back in. Good. All right, final thing here. We just did some nice warm up exercises. I'm going to set a timer on my watch for 30 seconds. What I want everybody to do is practice standing up and sitting down. When we stand up, move it toward the edge of the chair, pull your feet back. If you need to push from the armrest, totally fine. When you stand up, I want you to really kind of pull your arms back with you, just like we did in that power up move. All right, and everybody keep track of how many you did within that 30 seconds, because that'll be a good baseline. All right, ready, set, go. Up and squeeze. Good. Make sure you stand all the way up. Don't let a little bit of a bend stay in your knees. You want all the way up tall. You're over halfway there. Got 10 seconds. Really use those legs and power up tall. Three, two, and one. There's 30 seconds. All right, and then just finally, just kind of shake everything out, do a few marches, do some neck rotations. Kind of bring your ear towards your shoulder to get your neck stretched. And that is it. Thank you everyone for joining me and we will get back to your questions and answers. Thank you very much, Taylor. Now we're going to answer some of the questions our participants submitted during the presentation. Okay. Question one, why is sugar bad for someone with Parkinson's and is all sugar bad or primarily artificial sweeteners like stevia? So I believe stevia is a natural sweetener, um, not an artificial one. And so I don't consider stevia bad. It 
tastes bad, in my personal opinion, but I don't think it is bad for you. Um, uh, artificial sweeteners, specifically aspartame, is the one that has been shown to interfere with the body's ability to utilize dopamine and serotonin. And so we, we've actually, there's quite a bit of research on the role that, that aspartame does not do play well with dopamine transmission and dopaminergic cells. Sugar, um, if you notice on, on our data, um, there are a couple studies do say that people who eat a lot of processed foods and sweets are more likely to get Parkinson's disease, but our data does not actually suggest that sweets, I mean, fruit has more sugar, has a ton of sugar, and it's the second most best food out there. So I don't think sugar is necessarily bad per se. Um, what I will tell you is that how one's body handles sugar can be a huge problem. Every single patient I work with, I measure their blood sugar, their hemoglobin A1C, and we can actually see the higher somebody's blood sugar, the faster their brain atrophies, like literally shrinks. And so I do think it's really important to keep your blood sugar low. Um, hemoglobin A1C levels low, below 5.4 or so or lower, I'm happy with. But um, if a person comes to me and they have, you know, like a little, you know, chocolate and covered strawberries for dessert, and they've got a little bit of a sweet tooth and their blood hemoglobin A1C levels are low, I don't necessarily think that they're doing themselves danger by indulging in that. As opposed to a person with high blood sugar, I'm much more strict. And I say, sorry, you have the genetics that you have, but we need to, and the more you exercise, the better your body manages sugar. So sugar's complicated and it's not an across the board negative. Thank you, Dr. Mishley. Uh, question two, a person asks or says, I know that organic foods are better, but they are pricey as you had indicated, Dr. Mishley. Are there any types of foods that I should always buy organic? Eggs, milk, vegetables, produce, meat? Certainly meat, certainly, certainly, certainly meat and dairy. I mean, I would prefer you not even be eating meat and dairy. Think of all the money you're gonna save on meat and dairy. Um, you can spend that on upgrading a couple of your um, organic produce. Eggs, yes, I think, I think any animal products, it's really important to buy organic. And again, if you go to the environmental working group or if you just go to Google and type in dirty dozen, that's the list. That's the list that it is really, really, really important to buy organic. It's usually things that have a high water content, like lettuce and berries, strawberries, things that um, have more water. The things with the thicker skins, like papaya and pineapple and avocado, don't matter so much, usually. Thank you, Dr. Mishley. Uh, question three, you had mentioned the studies about fish consumption being linked to lower risk of cognitive impairment and dementia. Should I be concerned, this person asks, about my mercury intake and are all types of seafood beneficial? We don't know about all types of seafood and um, yes, mercury is an issue. Mercury is absolutely an issue. It is a bigger issue for um, growing children and women of childbearing age, women who are about to get pregnant. So for those of you watching this video who are planning on having a baby sometime soon, it is especially important for you to be watching your mercury con intake. Um, not huge issue. I mean, you don't have to be quite so careful after that. Um, but it, I, without getting on too much of a tangent, um, as part of my workup, one of the things I study is lithium deficiency in Parkinson's disease. And the, way, the gold standard way to measure one's lithium status is the inch of hair closest to your scalp tells us how much lithium you've been exposed to in the last three months. So for all my new patients, I measure their lithium levels, but the, the result page also tells me how much their mercury level, their arsenic, their aluminum. And so it's not what I went looking for, but I now have looked at the hair mercury levels of 3,000 patients with Parkinson's disease over the years. And I kind of get a sense of where the risk is. Um, I will say I'm so black cod is actually a much bigger risk than I thought. And um, you can see um, um, old amalgams, tuna, black cod, and old amalgams that are starting to break down is where I see people having higher mercury levels than what you would expect. Thank you so much, Dr. Mishley. I see that we posted um, the link to the Environmental Working Group website for everybody to take, a look, uh, to take a look at. And we have another question. Should people with Parkinson's avoid gluten, Dr. Mishley? Um, not necessarily. Wheat is a really, really good source of fiber and um, your life is already going to be a little more 
cumbersome with all of these recommendations. That the, the science does not say that people who eat bread in my study are doing worse than the people who don't eat bread. Um, and so, again, I have to stick with the data. And so um, I don't have a compelling reason to say no. But what, what I will tell you is very, very commonly in clinic, maybe once every week or two, I will have somebody say, I don't care what the data says. When I stopped eating gluten, my heartburn and my hemorrhoids were gone within the week. Mm -hmm. um, heartburn, hemorrhoids, and fatigue are probably the three things that I hear people say most often got better when they stopped eating gluten. And so whether patients know something the researchers don't, whether patients are placebo experiencing improvement, I don't know, but I would say it's easy enough. When, Start with this stuff that is evidence-based first. And once you get your groove there, um, if you wanna try a month or two of gluten-free, I think it's a reasonable experiment to do, but I don't have any reason to believe that gluten consumption is contributing to Parkinson's progression. Thank you. Uh, here's another question for you, Dr. Mishley. It sounds like we should try and avoid dairy. What about foods like Greek yogurt that have probiotics? Aren't those good for your stomach? You would think, but our data says, clear as day, the more yogurt a person eats, the faster their disease progresses. Wow. And I will tell you, the, the probiotic data is really complicated. I mean, at the World Parkinson Congress last year, somebody actually presented data showing that people with Parkinson's already had too much lactobacillus and bifidobacter. I mean, hmm. we, know, we, we know that the Parkinson's gut is messed up. We know that you're growing the wrong bugs, but we don't actually, it, it's a little premature to assume that we know which direction you're in, which organisms are too much, too little, or what any of those mean. So yeah, um, I do think that for people who are constipated, we have a couple good studies that show that a probiotic drink improves constipation, but that's very different than, um, than yogurt intake and they might, you know, it might be the probiotics are good, but the dairy is bad. And so, you know, it, it helps the symptoms, but accelerates progression. Um, I, I read someplace that the probiotics in most yogurts are dead within four days of leaving the factory. I mean, so it might be ah. that we don't, we're not even getting what we think we're getting. And so, um, no, I don't think that I am smitten enough with the idea of a probiotic supplement that I'm willing to tell you to eat something on the red list. That is really very fascinating information. Thank you very much. Uh, here's another one for you, Dr. Mitchley. What are your thoughts on plant-based meals and cheeses? Uh, does plant-based protein interfere with medication in the same way? It does. It does. It absolutely does. I've even had patients tell me a little bit of tofu in their, in their miso soup is enough to interfere. Um, plant protein absolutely interferes the same as animal-based protein. The difference is plant-based proteins are much easier to digest and they move through your intestinal tract a lot faster, whereas the, the animal-based proteins can take you know four to eight hours to move through what, what would take a plant-based protein 30 to 60 minutes. Thank you. We have some really good questions here. Uh, here's another one. Is it common to have a significant salt sodium deficiency? Yeah, um, I see it a lot. Um, and, and it's not just sodium. It's potassium. It's magnesium. Across the board, I see people with Parkinson's really, really, really low in electrolytes. Um, and so I do recommend that when people consume water that they actually add some electrolyte to it. There are a million different ways to do that. And um, Again, I, yeah, so, so there, are, there are ways to measure whether it's blood or hair. You can kind of see, you know, oh, it's not sodium you need, it's potassium, or it's not sodium and potassium that you need, it's magnesium. And so um, different people may have different mineral insufficiencies to contend with, but I do like the idea, you know, there are clues that people give us in clinic, you know, um, muscle tightness, uh, constipation, headaches, and um, tight muscles are symptoms of magnesium insufficiency. So, you know, there, there are things that we can try, uh, restless leg syndrome, muscle cramping, things like that, that would lead me one direction or another. But I, I use a lot more biomarker testing than most people do, blood, stool, urine, hair type stuff. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's a questioner who, who tells us that he or she has osteoporosis and needs to maintain a high intake of calcium. Uh, using uh, almond milk as a primary source of calcium. Do you have suggestions for other non-dairy options to increase calcium intake to over 1,200 milligrams? 
Sure. So, so first of all, um, I want to make sure that you're getting adequate calcium. The last thing we want is calcium insufficiency. Um, most of the plant-based milks that I use at my house, the oat milk, the rice milk, the soy milk, all have calcium fortified in there. So I get it, it that way. Green leafy vegetables, almonds, tofu is packed in calcium carbonate. Almonds have a ton of calcium. Um, it's, it's not that hard to get calcium from plant-based sources, but I will also stress there isn't a really compelling body of literature that says more calcium will build more bones. Um, there is data that says as long as your calcium is adequate, it's, it's the addition of vitamin D that will take the calcium that you have and send it to your bones. And so when we're actually kind of looking for how do, how do we help people maintain and build stronger bones, calcium is actually a smaller part of the equation than vitamin D status. And so yes, you need adequate amounts of calcium and to not let yourself become calcium deficient, but um, don't fall into the idea that more calcium is somehow better. It actually could be harmful. We need adequate calcium and adequate vitamin D levels plus weight bearing exercise is probably the best way to, to build healthy bones and prevent a fracture. Thank you. How do you manage the significant bloating that occurs in eating vegetables and fruits? I enjoy them, but my GI tract does not seem to. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's that um, in digestive enzyme insufficiency we were talking about. So there are a couple tricks. One is um, most enzymes are inducible, that um, it takes about three months, two to three months of eating something in your body will build the enzymes necessary to digest that. That isn't always the case, but that's usually the case. Um, so, so start slow. Steaming your Fresh vegetables um, makes them a little bit easier to digest. As you cook things, you break down a lot of those fibers and things and they become a little easier to manage. Um, smaller doses, um, there are lots of physicians who recommend digestive enzymes with meals. There's no question that helps. I tend to not do a lot of that um, simply because how many pills can you take in a day? Um, if the foods are more easily digested, like uh, if you ate, um, put all of those fruits in a smoothie and drank them, I, they're going to be easier to handle than if you ate a big bowl of fruit that you had to digest yourself in terms of breaking down some of those fibers. And then um, the, the thing I like to remember is, um, you know, we... Lemon juice, apple cider vinegar, things like that really do aid digestion. Um, this is just a little cool story, but the, the, the origin of why we eat a salad at the start of a meal, where that comes from is people used to eat really bitter greens like dandelion greens and vinegar at the start of a meal to kind of get their digestive juices flowing. The strong bitters and the vinegar would prepare the stomach for digestion. Um, and now we do iceberg and ranch, and it's it's just defeats the purpose. We've lost the we've lost the original idea behind it. But you can squeeze a little lemon juice on what you're eating, and that also will kind of help with digestion a little bit. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Uh, we have a question about brands of um, supplements. What brand of uh, glutathione and Q uh, Q10 have the doses you recommend? brands this person has seen are in much smaller doses. Also, there are many varieties each available. Any recommendations as to variety? That's a can of worms. <laughs> um, huh. um, so, so to our data does say, and this is, we've, we, we've published this previously, but we have new updated data that's even better. And I've purposely not gone public with it because I don't want a whole bunch of people running out to the supplement store without physician supervision and start taking all of this stuff. Um, our data does say um, that the people who are, who are supplementing with glutathione, um, pharmaceutical azelet, resagiline, coenzyme Q10, and fish oil, um, those are the four things people can take that seem to be associated with slower progression over time. And so that kind of makes sense given previous studies and how we understand these medicines and things like that. My PhD is in glutathione deficiency and Parkinson's disease. Um, we don't have uh, our data. We have not combed through the data yet to find out if, if intranasal glutathione is better than liposomal or liposomal is greater than oral. Um, I will tell you from my clinical experience um, in the last six months or so, I, I've, uh, because the data says 
people who take any form of glutathione is associated with slower progression. I've been telling people, it all seems to work. Cheap stuff, expensive stuff, like we don't know any better, so just get the cheap stuff. In the last couple months, um, I was shown data. There's a company that makes a liposomal pump that, that is, um, they had data showing it was as well absorbed as intravenous glutathione. And so I came back to my practice and started using that a little bit um, these last six months. And I will tell you, I've been using the oral capsules for a decade with my patients and nobody has ever come to me saying, boy, did I notice a difference. They, that really, really, really helped. I give it to people because I hope it slows progression, um, not because it improves their symptoms. And in the last six months that I've been using the new liquid liposomal pump version, um, I would say well over 50% of people are saying, I felt it within three days. My anxiety was better. My balance was better. I'm, the brain fog had cleared. Um, so I'm kind of excited. Uh, I'm learning too with all of you. I think most, most people in the Parkinson's community, the neuroscientists who study this would agree with the statement, glutathione deficiency contributes to Parkinson's disease progression. Um, what we don't know is, should you take it? Can we change the course of your disease if you start taking it? What form can you take? How much can you take? And so, um, you know, my best, so right now, my best guess, given the state of the data, is I have been using liposomal glutathione, and um, I'm guessing at the dose, but the research studies that I've been able to find use somewhere between five milligrams per kilogram body weight or 500 milligrams a day. And so um, it's, it can be expensive and it adds up. And we have, with each person, we kind of have a conversation about the pros, the cons, what are they expecting? What are they hoping for? What can they afford? That's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, for everyone, uh, this all is being recorded. If you need to go back and uh, um, listen again to uh, some of this wonderful information that uh, Dr. Mishley is giving us. Another question for you, Dr. Mishley, do GERD and medications used to treat it affect absorption of levodopa? They affect absorption of levodopa and of every food you put in of your food. Um, people who are on reflux medications are at increased risk of malnutrition, B12 deficiency, and even dementia. Um, the, those meds are intended to be short-term prescriptions, and I would encourage you, if you have reflux, to work with your provider to figure out what's causing it. Um, and try and avoid whether it's the spicy foods we eat. That's enough. like I said, the, one of the biggest things, like the hemorrhoids and heartburn are the two things that most people tell me get better when they give up wheat. So, so if you're one of these people who has reflux, kind of dive in, make, make that your new mission. Can I figure out what do, triggers my reflux so that I can get off these meds? And they're hard to come off of. There's a rebound uh, reflux that happens and you really do have to usually work with a prov provider to, to do it slow, do it right, and kind of figure out what your triggers are. Uh, you addressed uh, B12 deficiency a bit, but uh, this question is uh, asking if it's directly linked to PD and should he or she take a supplement. You should only take a supplement if you are deficient. Um, there's actually a case in the published medical literature called B12 deficiency misdiagnosed as Parkinson's disease. Um, B12 deficiency is a loss associated with loss of smell. I have a patient who is 25 years into their disease, and when they started supplementing B12 10 years ago, they've actually only gotten better since, right? And so was that B12 deficiency or Parkinson's? We don't know, right? And so, um, yes, I would say that Parkinson's aside, B12 deficiency is the most common vitamin deficiency among people over the age of 60. And B12 deficiency can cause a lot of symptoms that look a lot like Parkinson's disease and levodopa can interfere with B12. So we do find that people with Parkinson's wrestle with B12 deficiency more frequently, um, but that doesn't mean that every single person with Parkinson's needs to take a B12 supplement. Um, that's why I measure homocysteine levels once a year in all my patients. And if you're below a 10, you don't need to do anything. Your body's getting everything it needs um, from, B, from a B12 and folate perspective. If your homocysteine levels are high, then yeah, you probably will need some form of B vitamin supplement. Thank you. Uh, I just want to tell our uh, wonderful audience that uh, we will be able to take a few more questions um, uh, to give to Dr. Mishley. Uh, however, if we have not covered your question, please feel free to call the uh, helpline at uh, the Parkinson's Foundation. That number is 
1-800-473-4636. That's 1-800-473-4636. Okay, here's another question. Could you kindly repeat the correlation between peanut butter and dopamine absorption you mentioned earlier? It's a way that I get in some additional calories. Yep. Yeah. So what it is, is, so think of levodopa is essentially an amino acid and proteins are just strings of amino acids. So anytime you have protein from any source, plant or animal, when you eat protein, it breaks down into amino acids. And the way you absorb that is through the amino acid receptors in your intestinal tract. It just so happens that levodopa uses those same receptors to get into your system. So if you have peanut butter, say you have a, uh, I just had my breakfast was an oat milk smoothie with three bananas, peanut butter, and a little bit of chocolate, right? Um, so say you had, <laughs> say you have the, um, the big chunk, I had a lot of peanut butter in that smoothie. So if I were to take a levodopa capsule right now, there's really nowhere to, for it to go. The peanut butter has plugged all of those, those amino acid receptors. And so if you take the levodopa, it's not going to be as effective as if you had taken it on an empty stomach or without protein, um, only because there's competition. There are only so many receptors to go around. So you can have these little tricks. What patients will do is just take their levodopa 30 minutes before they eat, maybe drink it with a lemon juice or some vitamin C to kind of speed up its ability to break down. And many people will feel the levodopa kind of kick in. Like, okay, all right, it's in. Now I can go, but now I can go eat. And so I think that's kind of the cleanest, easiest way to do it. Thank you. I will add to that phone number I gave our audience earlier, uh, the opportunity to contact uh, by email helpline at parkinson.org if you have uh, more questions. Here's one for you, Dr. Mishley. What are some recommendations for someone with PD and diabetes? I try and eat a protein with carbs so I stay more level in blood sugar. Do you remember? Do you recommend protein shakes like pea protein? Um, maybe, maybe. Um, certainly, I, I, in fact, I will actually have many of my PD patients who don't have diabetes read um, Say No to Diabetes, I think is a really, really good book. Um, I think, I think this even more important, so, so the whole goal with diet and diabetes is to decrease and slow down the rate at which we hand sugar in over to your system. And so it is true that things like fat and protein can really, can really, um, if you eat your sugars with protein and fat, it can slow down the delivery of sugar to your system. It's very effective and it works, but fiber does the exact same thing. And so what a lot of people find is, um, you know, if, uh, you look up Dean Ornish, I think, has done a lot of great work on cardiovascular disease and diabetes and, and blood sugar regulation. And I was at a conference with him last fall, and he was giving a presentation on here are the food, like, you know, he, he is the only person in history to show that you can reverse cardiovascular disease, right? He's, he's done this over and over, ton, dozens of peer-reviewed publications in the medical literature. And he had his list of these are the foods you eat for um, cardio to prevent heart attack, strokes, and reverse diabetes. And it was the exact same list as the green list that I just showed you. I mean, I sat there feeling like I just wasted 10 years of my life. I should have just copied off a hit and put Parkinson's on the top of it and called it good. Um, and so I think as you start to look into that a little bit more, you realize whether we're talking about Alzheimer's management and prevention or Parkinson's Alzheimer's and management and prevention, diabetes or heart disease, we wind up with the same list of fruits, veggies, nuts and seeds, olive oil, coconut oil, you know, so fortunately you can feed several birds with the same seed. <laughs> I think we have another question. Can you, review, uh, can you review please homocysteine as a supplement and how to get the lab test and levels down to normal? Easy. Um, yeah, so so if homocysteine is something we all make, it's normal in every single one of us. And, and what, there are two problems associated with homocysteine. If you are deficient in B6, B12, folate, or betaine, your levels will start to creep up. 
And so, so it's a surrogate for those other problems. You know, it's not, it's not the homocysteine that's the problem, it's the low folate. It's not the homocysteine that's the problem, it's the low B12. So that's issue number one. Um, it's a, like I said, a cheap, easy blood test. Every one of your physicians knows how to order it, can order it. It's not alternative. Everyone learned in every medical school that, that homocysteine is the way, it is part of a neurological workup. Um, the second issue is that if homocysteine levels actually get too high, homocysteine itself becomes a neurotoxin. And so it's really important to kind of keep tabs on this, especially because we know for a fact that levodopa, the medicine you're all on, increase, raises your homocysteine. And the longer you're on levodopa and the more levodopa you take, the higher your homocysteine levels tend to be. And so um, I, I just feel like it's, it's an opportunity for prevention. It is true. We do not have a double-blind placebo-controlled trial that says if, if we find a whole bunch of people with Parkinson's with high homocysteine, we give them a B vitamin supplement to lower their homocysteine. I use one called homocysteine factors. It's 17 bucks a month. Um, if we give them a homocysteine lowering supplement that we can prevent dementia. That data does not exist. It doesn't, it, it, it's not a failed study. The study's never been done. Um, and so what I'm doing is just kind of practicing prevention. And if we know that high homocysteine is associated with faster Parkinson's progression and increased risk of dementia, let's screen for homocysteine and try and keep it down. And it can come down very, very easily with a homocysteine lowering supplement very inexpensively. I see we have two questions left. One is the final question, but I think I can put the both of them together for you, although they're not necessarily totally related. The first one's short. I think anyway, so it would be short. My home has well water. Should I only drink bottled water? And then the final question is, I see wine is on the good list. How much wine is too much? And are there <laughs> specific types that we should consume? And does alcohol affect my meds? So start with the water. Well, the water, water one is easy. Um, get your water tested. If it's low in manganese, and you don't, you don't have to worry about it. We think, we think probably some of the, or most of the problem associated with well water is probably manganese. Um, so if, if your water test comes out with low manganese, I wouldn't worry about that. Um, you can get a fancy water filter, but it also filters out a lot of the good healthy minerals too. And I'm not sure that we wanna do that. Um, wine is an interesting one um, because obviously you would think that when I say dose dependent more is better, we could get carried away with that. <laughs> Um, but my experience is that that doesn't happen with people with Parkinson's. People who loved to drink and even drank too much um, over the course of their life will often say to me, I don't know what happened, but when I got Parkinson's, I, I, I lost my tolerance. I can have one or two drinks and I feel horrible the next day. It makes my symptoms worse and I wake up just not feeling that good in the morning. I don't, um, you know, I, I, I am... Alcohol is a major devastating public health problem. And, and I, I certainly hear me loud and clear. If, if you're drinking too much and it's interfering with your functions and your family, you know, that's a problem in and of itself. It has to stop. Um, but what I have learned in clinic is most people will self-limit after a glass or two. They, the vast, vast majority of people with Parkinson's don't feel good if they go much beyond that. So, and sleep, people do not realize, um, my patients every year, there's, everyone does dry January, not everyone, but a lot of people do dry <laughs> January. And by, by the third week in January, people start coming in. How come you didn't tell me how much better I would sleep? How come you didn't tell me I'd start waking with morning erections? How come you didn't tell me? Like people start like, why didn't anyone tell me that alcohol was causing so many of these things? And so I do think that, um, too much of a good thing can be a problem and taking breaks is important, but um, we all need to have a little fun somewhere, so. Wonderful. Hey, a uh, big thank you to do, Doug, usually uh, Taylor and all of you who are able to join us today, today's program. It's been absolutely wonderful to have everybody here. Um, for any of questions we're unable to answer, remind, a uh, reminder for you to please contact the Parkinson's Foundation Helpline at 1-800-473-4636 um, or email at email, a helpline at parkinson, parkinson.org. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thanks again to our sponsor. Uh,
And I'm looking at a slide here that says, uh, Kiowa Kieran, we really appreciate uh, the sponsor who has made today's program possible. We hope to see you tomorrow for part two of our nutrition series featuring dietitian Beth Kitsis from Community Servings, who will show us how she prepares no heat meals, which would be perfect for this incredibly hot summer. We also will get some healthy eating tips from people affected by Parkinson's. Today, you will receive a short survey, survey by email after the program. Please take a minute to complete the survey. We would love to know what you thought and what else you'd like to learn about. We will also share a recording of today's session once it's available. For a complete lineup of virtual programs, please visit parkinson.org slash pdhealth. Thank you again for joining us and please stay healthy and safe. Goodbye now. <laughs>